Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is lecture 3i. We're going to have a very short lecture about a very useful form of regulation. We talked about how we can regulate the transcription of genes by telling RNA polymerase what to do, and we talked about how we can regulate protein activity by telling proteins what to do after they're made. This is a way of telling messenger RNAs not to make the protein that they code for. And this is a method that was developed in the laboratory. This similar processes do occur naturally, but the example I'm going to give you is one that was developed by genetic engineering techniques. And it was stimulated by the need for a special kind of potatoes for making purified starch. So potatoes, of course, are full of starch, and there's a particular kind of starch. There's two kinds of starch. One of them, amylopectin, is very widely used in industry, but it's hard to purify it away from the other starch, amylose. So plant biologists developed a way to turn off the gene for amylose, the gene that synthesizes amylose, amylose synthase. And the way they did this was by blocking the messenger RNA. So here's a diagram of the production of the starch in a potato. Note that this is a um, German potato. Here's the potato. Here's the gene for amylose synthase. And here's one strand of the DNA. And here's the messenger RNA that's made from this strand. If you look closely, you can see that the messenger RNA is complementary to each position. When that messenger RNA is transcribed, it produces an enzyme. Here's our enzyme here, which produces the starch amylose. Now, the engineers wanted to turn off the gene for synthesizing amylose, but rather than turning off the gene directly, instead, they turned off the messenger RNA. So what they did was they added into the plant's genome a new gene that was basically a inverted copy of the normal gene for amylose. It, not the whole gene, just part of the gene. So that when this gene is transcribed, it makes a molecule, an RNA, that's complementary to the messenger RNA. So if you look closely, you can take this RNA and flip it over. It will base pair with the messenger RNA. This is anti-sense RNA. And in fact, that's what it does in the cell. This antisense RNA base pairs with the messenger RNA. Now the messenger RNA is double-stranded. It can't bind to the ribosome. It can't be translated to produce the amylose synthase protein. And so these potatoes make no amylose. And they're very useful in the starch industry. So that's the whole story. Uh, that's one slide um, of antisense, a use of antisense RNA. Now, so what we've done is we've talked about how some RNA molecules can regulate transcription by binding a messenger RNA. I showed you one engineered example, but this is something that also happens in our cells. Now, a few points about, in general, about regulation before we go on to the next section, because we've done talking with about all the things that proteins can do, and now we're going to think about phenotypes in organisms and how genes control what organisms actually look like. So the things to remember about regulation is that it all depends on complementary fit between molecules. The um, regulation by transcription factors where those DNA binding proteins have a complementary fit to the base pairs of the DNA. Um, the activation of proteins, the protein activity regulators, where the small molecules that are regulating protein activity have a complementary fit to the regulatory subunits of the proteins. 
And the messenger RNA, the antisense RNA, which has a complementary fit to the messenger RNA. We talked about different kinds of changes, turning genes on, turning genes off, different kinds of consequences, and different causes. Some of these were natural occurring changes. Um, many of the flower phenotypes that you saw were caused by plant breeding, were isolated by plant breeding, perhaps after deliberately treating the plant with chemical mutagens. And the last one was a direct gene modification. Now, coming up next, we're going to start talking about diploids. We're going to think about how these ideas about what genes do fit into what happens when we have two copies of genes, because we do. We have two copies of every gene. And we're going to think first about the phenotypes of homozygotes, and then we're going to think about how these interactions between alleles produce the phenotypes in heterozygotes. I hope to see you there.